How many different rings can you make from 11 beads, given beads of three different colours? How many different patterns can you make by colouring the squares of a chessboard arbitrarily black or white? And how many different ways can you paint the faces of a cube, given three colours of paint? These three problems, which we're going to tackle in this programme, all involve counting. Let's start by looking at the problem involving the cubes. A cube has six faces, and you've got a choice of three colours for each face. That's three choices for this one, three for this one, three for this one, and so on. To get the total number of choices, we multiply these together, giving three to the six colourings in all. Here's another colouring. It looks different, but if I rotate this cube, it is in fact coloured exactly the same way as the first one. But what about this colouring? These adjacent faces are both green, so no matter how I rotate this cube, I can't make it look the same as the first two, because they only have one green face. So some of these colourings are certainly different, whilst others we regard as the same because we can rotate one into the other. The problem we're going to tackle in this programme is this. How many of the three raised to the power six possible colourings are different, where well, we mean different up to rotation? And the same thing happens with a chessboard. Some colourings look different, but are in fact the same because we can rotate one into the other. Our problem is, with this interpretation of different, how many chessboards are there? Similarly, these three rings look different. But if I rotate this one, it is exactly the same as this one. And this one is also the same if I flip it over. We'll count these three rings as the same, but how many different rings are there? We're going to use group theory to help us count the different colourings in each of these problems. We'll use an important result called the counting theorem. To see what's involved, I'll take a much simpler version of the chessboard problem. I'm going to look at two by two boards and count how many there are. Well, there are four squares with the choice of two colours for each. So there are two choices for this, two for this, two for this, and two for this. In total, that's two to the power four, which is 16 possible colourings. We want to know how many of these 16 are different up to rotation. If I take this colouring, with just one black square, then I can obtain these other three by rotating it. And if I take this colouring with black squares along a diagonal, then I can obtain this one by rotating it. This colouring with two adjacent black squares gives these three. And this colouring with three black squares gives these three but the colouring with four white squares gives no new colourings when it's rotated. And the same is true for the all black colouring. So I now have six subsets, representing the six different colourings of the board. Remember, I've counted two colourings as the same if I can rotate from one to the other. I'm now going to look at what we've done from a different point of view. This table has the 16 possible colourings of the board at the top. And down the side, I've got a group, the four rotations of the square. E, the identity. A, the anti-clockwise rotation through pi by 2. B, the rotation through pi. And C, through 3 pi by 2. Now, how do I fill in the entries in this table? Well, to fill in this entry, I take this rotation and apply it to this colouring. And what do I get? 
this coloring. In general, I take each of the rotations and apply it to each coloring in turn to give the corresponding entry. And the complete table looks like this. This is an example of a group action table. We say that this group acts on this set. Each element of the group acts on each element of the set like this. And if I look down any column of the table, I get all the colorings obtained by rotating the coloring at the top. Remember, we're going to regard all these colorings in the column as the same. Associated with the group action table is something that can help us with our problem, the idea of an orbit. In this example, the orbit of a given colouring is the set of all the colourings that can be obtained from it by rotation. For example, let's take this colouring. Its orbit is a set constructed by letting each rotation act on it in turn. But that's just this set of elements that occurs in its column. We write it like this. The same four colourings form the orbit of this colouring. And this one and this one. We say that these four colorings form a single orbit. Any one can be reached from any other by rotation. Now this coloring has just two colorings in its orbit. And the orbit of this coloring consists of the same two colorings. So these two colorings form another orbit. From each one you can get to the other by rotation, but that's all you can't escape from the orbit. And this colouring is alone in its orbit. It can't be rotated into any other colouring. But how can orbits help us with our problem? Well, remember, we're trying to find different colourings of the board. Now an orbit collects together colourings which we count as the same, forming a block of elements in the table. Each block corresponds to one orbit. So the number of different colorings is precisely the number of orbits. In this problem there are only 16 possible colorings, so it's easy to construct this action table to count the orbits. But for our original problems such tables would be far too big to handle. So can we avoid writing them out? Well we can. And to do that, we introduce the idea of a stabilizer. In this column, there are two places where the colouring at the top appears in its orbit. Here and here. In other words, there are two rotations which leave this colouring unchanged when they act on it. We say that they stabilize it. The stabilizer of this colouring is the set of rotations that leave it unchanged. This colouring has two rotations in its stabiliser, which we write like this. We'll keep track of which group element stabilises this colouring by putting ticks in the table. For this colouring, there's only one rotation that leaves it unchanged, the identity. Its stabiliser has only one element. So in this column, there's only one tick. And for this colouring, all the rotations leave it unchanged when they act on it. So its stabilizer has four elements. And there are four ticks. We can repeat this for all the other colorings to get this pattern of ticks. Remember, the ticks show you which colorings are stabilized by which rotations. I'm now going to divide the table into blocks corresponding to the six orbits we found earlier. Notice that in each block of the table, there are exactly four ticks. In this block, there are two colorings in the orbit, and each coloring has two rotations in its stabilizer. In this block, there's only one coloring in the orbit, but it's stabilized by all four rotations. And in this block, there are four colorings in the orbit, but each is fixed by the identity alone. In each block, we have an illustration of one of the classic results of group theory, the orbit stabilizer theorem. If a finite group G acts on a set X, 
then for each element in x, the size of its orbit times the size of its stabilizer equals the order of the group. Remember that to solve our counting problems, what we want is the number of orbits. The orbit stabilizer theorem tells us that the number of ticks in each block of this table is equal to the order of the rotation group. We also know that the number of blocks is equal to the number of orbits. So the total number of ticks in the table is just the number of orbits multiplied by the order of the group. I can find another expression for the total number of ticks in the table by simply adding them column by column. The number of ticks in each column is the size of the corresponding stabilizer. So the total number of ticks in the table is obtained by finding the size of the stabilizer of each coloring and adding them up. From this, we can state the counting theorem. To find the number of orbits, find the size of the stabilizer of each element, add them up, and then divide by the order of the group. But there's another way of expressing this result. I've counted the number of ticks in the table by adding columns, but I could have counted them by adding rows. And instead of having to work out the stabilizers of the 16 colorings, I'd only have to deal with the four rotations. So what does it mean to look at the ticks in one row of the table? Remember, a tick means that the coloring is stabilized by the rotation that acts on it. So the ticks in this row indicate the set of colorings that are fixed by the rotation B. We call this the fixed set of B, and we write it like this. And now I can restate the counting theorem. To find the number of orbits, find the size of the fixed set of each element in the group. Add them up, and then divide by the order of the group. So let's take stock of what we've done so far. To solve each of our counting problems, we need to find the number of orbits. And to do that, we have this counting theorem, which expresses the number of orbits in terms of fixed sets. Well, we're now in a position to solve the three problems we posed at the beginning of the program. First, the eight by eight chessboards. How many different patterns, up to rotation, can you make by coloring the squares black or white? The group that acts on the set of colorings is again the group of rotations of the square, which has four elements. We need to find the fixed set of each of these elements. First, the identity. That's easy. It fixes all the possible colorings. And how many of those are there? Well, there are 64 squares on the board, each with a choice of two colors, black or white, giving a total of two to the 64 possible colorings. How do we find the fixed set of A, the rotation through pi by two? Well, for a coloring to be in the fixed set of A, it must stay the same after rotation by A. So if this square is colored black, so must this one and this one, and this one. In fact, we can color one quarter of the board any way we like. But then the pattern we've chosen must also appear rotated in this quarter, and this one, and this one. So how large is the fixed set of A? Well, there are 16 squares in one quarter of the board, so there are two to the 16 ways of coloring it. And each pattern gives a coloring of the whole board, which is fixed by A. So the fixed set of A has two to the 16 elements. And the same argument holds for C, rotation through three pi by two. Finally, let's look at the fixed set of B, the rotation through pi. Let's choose a colouring for one half of the chessboard. For this colouring to be fixed by B, the pattern in the top half of the board must also appear rotated at the bottom. 
There are 32 squares in one half of the board, so there are two to the 32 ways of colouring this half. And each pattern we choose for the top half gives a colouring of the whole board, which is fixed by B. Now let's apply the counting theorem to find the number of different chessboards. We add the sizes of these fixed sets and then divide by the order of the group, which is four. And that gives this number of different colorings, a number with 19 digits. Now the rings. The problem is to count how many different rings there are containing 11 beads with an unlimited supply of beads of three different colors. We must allow for rotations and flipping the rings over. This time, the group acting on these colorings has ordered 22. It has 11 rotations, that's the identity and 10 more, and 11 flips. We need to work out the size of the fixed set for each of these 22 group elements. Well, the identity fixes all the possible colorings, and how many of those are there? There are 11 beads, with a choice of three colors for each, giving a total of three to the 11 colorings. What about the other 10 rotations? Let's look at the rotation which takes each bead round to the next one. We'll choose a color for one of the beads. Then, for the rotation to fix this coloring of the ring, the bead in the rotated position must be the same color as the first bead. But then so too must the next one, and the next one, and so on round the ring. The beads on the ring must all be the same colour. So there are only three colourings in the fixed set of this rotation. The all red one, the all yellow one, and the all blue one. And the same goes for all ten non-identity rotations. Each one has a fixed set with three colourings. That leaves the group elements that flip the ring. And we can use a similar argument here. Let's look at the flip about this axis of symmetry. We'll choose a colour for the bead on the axis. And now let's choose colours for the five beads on one side of the axis. Now if the flip is to fix this colouring, the beads on the right hand side of the axis must have the same colours as the corresponding ones on the left. We've chosen the colours of these six beads arbitrarily, which we can do in three to the six ways. So the fixed set of this flip contains three to the six colourings. And the other flips are just the same. So each of the 11 flips has a fixed set containing three to the six colorings. And now I can apply the counting theorem to find the total number of different rings. I add the sizes of these fixed sets and divide by the order of the group, which is 22. And that gives this number, over 8,000 different rings. Finally, let's return to our cube colouring problem. How many colourings are there up to rotation when we have three colours available? This time, our group is the group of all rotations of the cube, which has 24 elements. We need to calculate the fixed set for each rotation. First, the identity. Well, as before, it fixes all the possible colourings, and there are three to the six of them. Next, let's look at a face rotation through an angle of pi by 2. Let's choose a colour for this face. Since the rotation fixes the colouring, this face must be the same colour. And so must this one. And this one. So the central band must be all one colour. All orange, all lilac, or all green. That's three choices. 
but the top face can be any colour. That's another three choices. As can the bottom face. Three more choices. So the fixed set has three to the power of three colorings. And there are six such face rotations, each of which fixes three to the three colorings. There are also face rotations through an angle of pi. Here, the left and right faces must be the same color because each is rotated into the other. That gives a choice of three colors. Similarly, the back and front faces must be the same color. Three choices again. And as before, there are another three choices of color for the top face. And another three choices for the bottom. three to the four colorings. And there are three such face rotations. Next, let's look at the vertex rotations. Here, these three faces must be colored the same, a choice of three colors. And these three must also be colored the same. Another three choices. So the fixed set contains three squared colorings. And there are eight such vertex rotations, two for each of the four possible axes. Finally, let's look at an edge rotation through pi. Here, these two faces must be colored the same. That's three choices. And these two. Another three choices. Similarly, the back and front faces must be the same color. Three choices again. So the fixed set contains three to the three colorings. And there are six such edge rotations, one for each opposite pair of edges, giving a total of six times three to the three. I can now apply the counting theorem to find the total number of different colorings. I add the sizes of these fixed sets and then divide by the order of the group, which is 24. Working this out, I find that there are just 57 varieties of colored cubes. <laughs>